Hey there, Euro Bears. This recorded slideshow lecture is about Raphael Sanzio da Urbino. Raphael of Urbino. Urbino is a city in central Italy, not too far away from Rome. Raphael of Urbino. So thus far in uh, European history, we've studied Donatello, then Leonardo, then Michelangelo, and now Raphael. Sounds a lot like those Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Now, I didn't grow up with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I'm too old for them. But I've talked to some of my younger colleagues about these characters and asked them about some of their personalities. And when I described like Raphael, and Raphael's kind of a bit of a playboy, they're like, no, 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 that sounds like Michelangelo and the Turtles. So I don't know much about how these Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles got created, but it sounds like they aren't modeled too terribly closely after the personalities of the actual painters. From what I understand, uh, it was an art school student who had studied uh, too much of the Italian Renaissance painters and just named uh, his new characters that he created back in the 80s or whenever after them. So Raphael da Urbino, what was he really like? He's very different from the other two contemporary uh, Italian painters that we know about, Leonardo and Michelangelo. When we think about Leonardo da Vinci, we think about somebody with just an incredible mind, a Renaissance man who was working on a bunch of different things at once. Uh, the patrons didn't really like him because he, he was in the habit of not finishing works that he started. He got distracted and was off doing something else. Uh, but Leonardo, a very you know, colorful figure, which we could, uh, if we could go back in, ta in time, he'd be fun to hang out with. Michelangelo, dark, brooding, didn't really like having a lot of people hanging around him, certainly hated apprentices, uh, and he just wanted to do his own work, and he had a, con a, a, a contemptuous relationship with the Pope. Raphael is very different from both of those guys. Raphael was raised by his dad, who was himself a painter, and Raphael was raised to be a painter, and Raphael loved being a painter, and he loved the spotlight. Uh, when he was patronized by Pope Julius II, the same Pope who, pa who patronized Michelangelo, he had a very good relationship with Pope Julius II. And let's just put Pope Julius II up here. And Raphael uh, ha always had throngs of apprentices, loved having these guys follow him around. Rapha or Raphael would start artwork and then have his apprentices finish the artwork for him. Raphael had no problem with this, as opposed to Michelangelo, who wanted to do everything himself. So Raphael was this kind of very happy-go-lucky guy and really enjoyed the spotlight. Uh, now, when I think of Raphael, uh, I think of, uh, if, if Raphael was around today, like what he would be like, I think of a rock star. Because there are rock stars who are rock stars because they like playing music and they want to make music. But certainly there's a lot of rock stars out there who became rock stars because they wanted the lifestyle that accompanied it. They wanted the parties. They wanted the attention of the fans. They probably wanted to have lots of boyfriends or girlfriends or whatever. And that's what I think of when I think of uh, Mike, when I think of Raphael. And, and Pope Julius II, who we're looking at right here, Pope Julius II was friends with him and really afforded him this lifestyle. Now let's take a look of some, at some of Raphael's paintings. Raphael's paintings are like this. They are very nice, they are very gentle, they are very playful, they are very happy, they have none of the, uh, uh, the, the experimentation of Leonardo, and they don't have any of the edginess of Michelangelo. They're just nice, pleasant paintings. Probably So look at this. This is Madonna and Child from the early 16th century. I mean, you just have a playful, squirmy Jesus with his mother. And that's what you get with uh, Raphael. Uh, another Madonna and Child. This is probably one of the most famous things that Raphael has painted that you probably have seen. Taking a look at this, you have uh, a mother and child, uh, the, uh, Mother Mary and baby Jesus there as the center of this painting. Uh, looks like we have a curtain being withdrawn to, to show them off. We have two other figures uh, looking at them. And then down the bottom, you have these cute little angelic cherubs looking up at them. This looks like a Hallmark card, and in fact, it has been used by Hallmark. Uh, it's just a nice, gentle image. And you look at this, you look at mother and child, it's just a nice, soft, gentle image. So this is what you get with Raphael. This was an individual, a painter, who the patron said, Here, here's what we want. We want a nice image for our church. And Raphael delivers these cute little angels. You've seen them before. These are Raphael's. 
Now, it's worth noting that even though Raphael was so different from Michelangelo, Raphael adored Michelangelo. He looked up to Michelangelo. He recognized the genius of Michelangelo. My, Raphael, a little bit younger than, than Michelangelo, tried to hang out with Michelangelo. Michelangelo naturally wanted nothing to do with Raphael and couldn't kick him away hard enough. So Raphael took matters into his own hands. Because he's close friends with Pope Julius II, Raphael was, in, was enabled to sneak into the Sistine Chapel at night to see what Michelangelo was doing. Michelangelo would have killed Raphael had he known that he, known he was sneaking into the Sistine Chapel, but Raphael did it anyways and studied what Michelangelo was doing, was just astounded by the talent and technique of Michelangelo. And that's not the only thing that Raphael snuck into. During the reign of Pope Julius II, Pope Julius II had encouraged, through tax breaks, for Roman citizens to begin developing uh, their own palaces so that Rome would be a nicer city. And this tax incentive worked. So a lot of Rome was being bulldozed uh, at the time of Pope Julius II as new palaces were being built. And in the middle of downtown Rome, in the middle of downtown Rome, uh, a palace was uh, being built and they exposed uh, a, a Roman ruin. And Raphael heard about this and he goes to the Roman ruin and he goes underground. This thing was underground and he climbs down and he discovers these beautiful Roman frescoes and this beautiful Roman tile work and studied it. I mean, this was amazing stuff. It's big, it's huge, it's ancient, it's pagan. Uh, and, and, and this experience itself was kind of the spirit of the Renaissance going back to classical civilization and wanting to recover it and bring it back and make it and combine it with the Christian world. So what you're looking at here are big, beautiful uh, frescoes and tile work uh, that the Romans did. Here's another image of that. And then this final image I have for you is a more recent image. Uh, you can visit the Domus Aris today. And uh, so here we go. So being inspired by Michelangelo and being inspired by uh, this ancient Roman ruin. The Pope hires Raphael to do a painting, a fresco in his library. So let's look at what today we call Vatican City, the area that the Pope controls at this point in time in history. What you see there is uh, the first thing on the left there, the big church, that St. Peter's Basilica. Let's remember that Michelangelo designed that dome there. If you can, take a look at the colonnade that stretches out in front of St. Peter's Basilica. That was designed by another uh, uh, um, sculptor by the name of Bernini, who's not yet around yet. So that colonnade uh, does not yet exist. And St. Peter's is really just being built at this point in time in history. Again, just to say it once again, the construction of St. Peter's Basilica will lead to the Reformation. And we'll talk about that when we get to the Reformation. The Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo painted the, uh, the, all, the, the, the wall behind the altar there as well as the ceiling. So uh, there's two works of Michelangelo. And then Raphael has been asked to fresco uh, a wall in the Pope's library. So that's, you see here, this is where uh, Raphael is going to paint probably the most important painting we need to know about. And that painting is this painting. This painting is called The School of Athens. Let's take a look at it. What do you see here? Well, first let's look at the painting as a whole. Notice that it's sort of evenly divided. It's very geometrically perfect. On the bottom half of this painting, you have human beings. On the top half, you have this architecture. Notice that the architecture has a particular design where we have perspective, things that are closer to us are bigger, Things that are farther away are smaller. It's perfect in, in that particular way. You also have a vanishing point. Uh, there seem to be these lines that go right in between the heads of the two center figures that we see here. And uh, that's, that's where our vanishing point is. So this makes it an excellent example of a Renaissance painting. Now, who is in this painting in what we call the School of Athens? Well, all but one of the figures represented here are ancient classical pagans. Only one person in here is a monotheist, and that person is not a Christian. And this is in the Pope's library. 
So this is an amazing painting. I can't actually myself imagine a pope today in the 21st century having a fresco like this done and put in the Vatican. All pagans, all non-Christians, every single one of them, and these are the people that we're celebrating. And this reflects the, the attitude of not just Raphael, but of his patron, Pope Julius II, in terms of what is important at this point in time in history. It doesn't have to be 100% perfectly Christian. These ancients have something to deliver us to. Now, let's kind of focus in on some of the people in this painting. Um, first of all, it's important to know that um, most of the people in this painting would not have been alive at the same time, and very few of them were actually Athenians. But if we go into the center of this, uh, the, the two guys that we see in the center who are sort of striding down the hallway right at us, uh, these two guys did spend some time in Athens. One of them was himself an Athenian, and they are two very important people in the Western intellectual tradition. And here they are as we look at them more closely. To our left, bearded, pointing up to the sky, that is Plato. On, on our right, gesturing down to the earth, that's Aristotle. And if you're a good student of European history, you know exactly why Raphael would paint Plato pointing up to the sky pointing up to the heavens, pointing up to the pure forms of which our lives are but a dim reflection. And you would also know why Aristotle would be gesturing down to the earth as they're looking at each other, striding towards us. It's almost like Plato is saying, no, 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 Aristotle, the, the earth isn't what we should study. Our lives aren't we, what we should study. We should conceive of the pure forms, the heavenly forms, the one... God or, or thing that we, if we can call him that, 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 that's, that, that's perfect. That's what we should focus our attention on. And Aristotle think, talking back to him saying, no, 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 no. The earth is what we should study. Life here on earth is what we should, we should study. So here we, ha here we have the perfect embodiment for the entire Western intellectual tradition, spirituality versus science. And what's more important to you personally, and what's more important to us, most important to us collectively, and of course we have both of these in our tradition. So Aristotle and Plato. Now it's also worth noting the model for who Plato is. That's not actually Plato. I mean, who knows what Plato looked like? That's Leonardo da Vinci. So Raphael took Leonardo da Vinci and painted him as Plato. All right, let's move beyond this to some other people in the School of Athens. This is a Greek philosopher named Heraclitus, and Heraclitus lived before Socrates, so he's considered a pre-Socratic philosopher. But we're not going to talk about his philosophy at all. That right there is Michelangelo. So his boots that uh, he would wear all the time, and supposedly he wore so long that he didn't bathe a lot that sometimes they took skin off when he, pu when he, when he pulled them off. Uh, we get a sense of Michelangelo's strength, his beefiness. Uh, see, he would spend his days chiseling away, building up his muscles, and dark brooding, looking down at the ground. Uh, this is a very accurate picture of probably what Michelangelo looked like because Raphael knew Michelangelo. Here we have the ancient mathematician Euclid. Here we have the uh, a, 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 an astronomer from the Library of Alexandria, a man by the name of Ptolemy, who will study more when we talk about the scientific revolution. Ptolemy came up with a model for the solar system by which we could predict the motion of the stars and the planets. Also, if you look at this particular image, the one individual who's looking directly at us, the viewer, that is Raphael himself. We have a, a Greek general, who could very well be Alexander the Great. Other people believe that he might be the Athenian general during the Peloponnesian Wars, a man by the name of Alcibiades. Talking to somebody here is our old and considerably ugly Socrates. And here is Hypatia of Alexandria, one of the few women in this painting. And here we have a couple of individuals. Um, the guy writing in the book could very well be Pythagoras. And then looking over his shoulder is a man by the name of Ibn Rushd, 
sometimes referred to as Averroes. Ibn Rushd is our one monotheist in this painting. He was a Muslim who lived in Andalusian Spain. He was an Aristotelian philosopher and mathematician and a bunch of other stuff. He was sort of a pre-Renaissance Renaissance man out of the Iberian Peninsula. So isn't it interesting? The one monotheist we have in this particular painting is not a Christian, but rather a Muslim. And this painting is up in the Pope's Library, the School of Athens. What an excellent example of Renaissance artwork, talking about bringing the classical civilizations back to life and celebrating their intellect, their intellect and, and all their intellectual contributions that we can embrace and bring into our modern Christian society of 15th century Italy. It's an incredible thing. Or I'm sorry, I should say 16th century Italy is when this was painted. So what an incredible painting for us to study for uh, the Renaissance, the School of Athens, probably Raphael's most important painting for our studies in AP European history. One last painting from Raphael, and this one's just a fun one. Raphael, like I said before, was a little bit of a playboy. Uh, he really loved his celebrity status in Rome. Uh, he really loved the attention. Uh, he really was not a fussy painter. If you were willing to pay him a lot of money, he'd deliver the goods in terms of whatever it is that you wanted to have painted. Now here's a painting that Raphael did for himself. Uh, no patron for this one. Uh, he used his own money to go out and get his paints and to paint this one. But we learn a little bit about Raphael's personal life from this. Raphael never got married. Uh, most men were expected to get married. Raphael said, no, I'm not getting married. Uh, we do have evidence that he was possibly engaged to a cardinal's daughter for a period of time, but that never panned out. Raphael famously had a bunch of mistresses all around Rome, and with one of his mistresses, he offered to paint her, and this is the painting that we see here. So he never married the woman, but he promised her that she would live forever as one of the subjects for one of his paintings. And so here we have this rather erotic painting of one of Raphael's mistresses. But as he promises that she will live forever in art, we take a, little, we take a closer look at it. Look at her armband that she has on her left arm. As we focus in on it, we see that Raphael has tagged her. Raphael Urbinus or Raphael of Urbino so that he too is living forever in his art, which is why 500 years later, we're still studying Raphael of Urbino. And that's it for this recorded slideshow. Thanks for watching Euro Bears. I'll see you in class.